Hello, everyone. My name is Yi Shi, and I am a venture fellow here at New Chip. Today, we are going to talk about travel and hospitality. Back in 2020, COVID-19 had a huge impact across the world. The travel industry was particularly vulnerable during the pandemic. Airlines are losing money, hotel groups are laying off people, event planners are moving their events online, and so on. There's just so much bad news. To address some questions and concerns in the industry, I invited three specialists today to talk about their experience and potentially some suggestions. Without further ado, let's go ahead and let them introduce themselves to the audience. Sun, would you mind taking the lead? Sure, uh, Yi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Sun Chang. I'm one of the co-founders for um, Telegenic. Uh, we build a uh, touchless, smart um, uh, media solution for the hotel rooms. Um, and our platform also allows us to do um, IoT and um, in-room social networking messaging amongst the hotel guests that are staying in the same property. Um, I do come from a tech background. I spent 20 years collectively at uh, Microsoft and Samsung. So I have uh, software and hardware experience and I'm trying to bring uh, that type of technology to hotel guests uh, throughout the world. Awesome, thank you, Sun. Later we have Sarah. Yes, yay, thank you so much for having me. So I'm Sarah Groen. I own and manage Bell and Buy Travel, which is a high touch travel advising service. We act like in addition to our clients as professional management teams. So we're not only planning their trips, but also acting as a true advisor to help make sure that they achieve all their life experiences. We are really kind of the go to travel advisors for VCs, private equity folks, executives, and successful entrepreneurs. Um, in addition to that, sort of my side project, which uh, keeps, keeps things fun, is that I host the first authoritative podcast on luxury travel called Luxury Travel Insider, and our guests are the top founders, owners, and CEOs in the luxury travel market. Aside from travel and my love and focus on that, I'm an investor myself, and I previously worked at Uber, launching and running Uber Eats in Houston and Phoenix, and I co-founded the first accelerator in Houston. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. And last but not least, we have Scott. Hello, everyone. Very hard to follow Sarah's introduction there, but I will do my best. My name is Scott and I'm the founder and CEO of Pill. We are an online travel tech platform and vacation rental management company. As you will hear from the accent, I'm based in Scotland in the UK. We currently look after over a thousand units, but we are expanding into America and uh, five European countries in the next few months. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sagat. Um, so now let's just kick into the topics. So 2020 has already passed. Now it's 2021, but COVID-19 is still here. We all know that the travel and hospitality industry has been hit hard last year, but what are some impacts that you have seen on the startups, on old ventures, or should I ask how bad it is for the whole industry during this special time? So we will start with Sun again. Well, um, you're right. It's really been, uh, I think, a tough uh, year and a half or so. Um, it's really hard to get traction in terms of sales. Uh, unless you're selling like hand, hand sanitizers, right? So um, hotels are, it's not an exaggeration to say hotels are like in panic mode. A lot of the, even the like leadership uh, positions have been, uh, have been uh, removed. And so for me personally, a lot of the contacts at the C level of hotel brands, well, they were there one week, but they're not there the next week, right? So um, it's really been a struggle, um, but I think um, if you're building uh, products or services that were like unnecessary before, that becomes necessary because of the pandemic, then I think it's okay. Um, I think it's just, we just have to be patient about when the market will move forward again. Um, and then um, I think the traction will happen but it'll take a lot of time, but I think it'll happen again. Yes, yes, great. Thank you, Sun. Sarah, so from your perspective as an investor and entrepreneur, what's your take on this? 
Um, actually, I, my take on it is more from my travel company. So just yes. to give a sense, since I'm a, I was like really on the sort of the front lines of it, we were starting to reschedule um, and trips for clients to leave starting in February. Um, so it was, it was really bad in those first few months. I think April and May, we were, my business was down like 90 to 95% in terms of revenue. Um, but like the, the, the saddest part was seeing, like Sun was saying, hotels just, just getting demolished in terms of like their businesses and their business models, right. cruise lines, the entire industry, they've all faced huge dramatic layoffs and furloughs. Um, but then, you know, since May, like people adjusted really quickly, um, I actually think your product could be really interesting, Sun, because of because of that, because hotels moved so fast, especially at the luxury end, to be able to still serve their clients. Like we were seeing um, in the summer in the U.S. at the top luxury properties, fully booked, double the rates of last year. It was crazy. So the demand stayed. It was the the ease, not ease, sorry, the the rapidness of the hotels making these switches that I think was really important. And I think those who are going to thrive, if I put my investor hat on and I kind of know what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling in the industry, those who are going to thrive are the ones who have been the most flexible and have really maintained their humanity. So um, the hotel from the cruise lines who put the clients' needs first, who said, okay, here's your money back. I know you can't go on a cruise or I understand even though you could come, you don't feel safe. I'm going to give you a refund even though you're within penalty. Those folks are going to be rewarded by the clients, by the travel advisors, by the entire industry. Um, the catch is obviously to be able to do that, you need to be pretty well capitalized. You can't just like hand out cash if you don't have it. So I think coming out of this, the the the, the well capitalized cruise lines, hotels, even Airbnb, how they handled everything, um, giving money back to um, to the clients and also covering the costs for the hosts. Like that was an insane amount of capital, um, but I think it gave them a ton of goodwill in the industry. So folks that are focusing on those two things or have the ability to focus on those two things will probably come out of this as winners. Thank you, Sarah, great insights. And also Scott, um, from your perspective as a, you know, a property management company, how's the industry doing? And also what's your take on this as well? Yeah, so Suns covered hotels and, and Sarah covered travel for vacation rental industry. It's for a lot of it, for a lot of 2020, and as I speak, it's actually illegal to um, make money in our industry. There's police stopping, you know, travellers. We need to give key worker letters. So we find that it's it's illegal to do vacation rentals to tourists. So again, the government are very, very clear in that. So we can't make money. Now, there are other markets there. So corporate travellers are still allowed, key workers, um, contractors. So as long as they have a, a key worker letter and a reason, but the tourist market is totally dead and illegal. And many businesses, many hospitality establishments in this country are surviving only because of government assistance. So there's lots of lots of good things given to hospitality uh, and the staff. For example, we get 80% of our wages paid furlough by the government. So the government let people go home, but the government pay 80% of wages. So the, the effects haven't yet been seen. And as Sarah said, the cash flow to, to keep this running is important. But when the government stopped paying people's wages, we're going to find that a lot of the establishments won't open back up. People who still believe they have a job won't have jobs. So I think actually when we come out of this, we'll see the biggest impact for the vacation rental industry in the UK, at least, um, rather than what's happening just now, because there's a lot of support. Uh, I suppose the final point for me is a lot of businesses, the whole distribution chain has been taken away because they didn't, they didn't rely, they relied too heavily on the OTAs, the online travel agents. So Airbnb and booking.com, as Sarah mentioned, your listings were closed. They refunded all the money. And even if you had a legitimate reason to accept a guest, you, you couldn't advertise anywhere. So for us and our clients, we were lucky that we had direct booking sources where people came to us. But if you relied on the OTAs like HomeAway, TripAdvisor, Airbnb and Booking.com, that's the big four in our country. You were invisible. You, you couldn't get guests. So that has an impact. And Airbnb, very... They're, 
They're very good at doing what countries and governments want. So they will play the good guys for the PR exercise and quite rightly so they do the fair thing. So at Christmas, for example, we had a very busy Christmas and New Year and they changed the legislation, made another lockdown and we had to give all our money back. So it was nice that we had a lot of income for us and our clients, but we gave the money back and we very much let's say there, it's the right thing to do. So some people are taking the money and not giving it back, but again, that's unethical. We wouldn't want to be treated like that and we want all our guests to get refunds and hopefully they'll book when we're allowed to book again. Right, right. Thank you so much, Scott. Yes, uh, all good answers from here. We talk about government involvement. We talk about cash, um, but sometimes this is very, all very useful information. So most people say that every time there's a crisis, there will be innovation. So in order to tackle the situation, like San just mentioned, you probably want to develop some new technology. Some event management firms are all selling their remote conference solutions. Have you seen or thought about any new solutions or different approaches for the industry to adopt or they're developing right now that you think, oh, it's interesting. And then we've, along the way, it will be more and more things like this. Uh, we'll start with you again, Sun. Yeah, so I think um, a lot of what's um, taking off now existed in the past, but it wasn't just much of a priority, I suppose. So one of the things that I see happening more and more is uh, mobile check-in. Uh, just like uh, when you book a flight, you don't have to go to the service desk anymore. You, on your you know, airline app, uh, you can check in and get your boarding pass. So very similarly, uh, hotels are starting to adopt that solution more. Uh, so you don't have to stop at the flight desk. They don't want the crowding in the, in the lobby. And... Um, um, and that also allows us to, uh, you know, uh, you know, develop new technologies. I think it's like several ways people do that. You know, you have RFID enabled smartphones. You have the app itself. So I think more and more people are focusing on that. It existed in the past. For example, the Hyatt has a mobile app check-in, but uh, more and more hotel brands are starting to think about that. Um, and, um, but I think it doesn't have to stop there, actually, uh, even though that type of solution existed. For example, um, you can probably just use geofencing now. The, the, the technology exists where you just walk up uh, to your hotel room and the door opens. And then when you leave, uh, it just kind of locks behind you. So you can make it even better with existing technology uh, when the focus is put on not having to uh, be face to face with anyone. Um, but I think um, the innovation, different kind of innovation will happen as hotels start to innovate how they service their clientele. Uh, so for example, a lot of hotels are adopting a sort of a monthly rental option where for a set fee, say $1,500, you could stay in any one of their properties uh, throughout the world. And so as uh, some of the larger companies are allowing their workers to uh, work remotely, and some companies, I won't name who, actually even have permanent work from home option available. Um, and so, uh, so these types of people, you know, they may just decide not to renew their lease on their apartment and just hit the road. Uh, work from uh, Asia one month, work from you know, Europe another month, uh, and things of that nature. So I think hotels are definitely trying to uh, modify you know, the type of uh, you know, service uh, to the travelers. And so for these people, it'll be like their home. And so they will have different needs than the, than the people vacationing or the people, the really common traveler actually only stays one or two nights. But if you're staying a week, a month, or even many months at a single, uh, at a hotel, then your needs are gonna be different. So I think uh, when hotels start to really innovate in their service uh, area, you'll probably see uh, other types of innovation that, that come down the line to cater to those 
very interesting because hospitality industry was kind of notorious for not being innovative for a while. And then they are very slow on adopting new technologies. I think right now, maybe COVID-19 is a good thing for them to pursue a better path, a better approach to the customer service as well. Uh, thank you, Sun. Uh, next, Sarah, uh, do you, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a really interesting um, line of thought, son. I was thinking the same thing. So we all have those friends who have broken their lease in San Francisco and they're living in COVID pods and working from wherever. Um, and at the luxury travel end, we're seeing that as well. So it's not just, you know, digital nomads who are wanting to stay, have long-term stays. We're having like top end professionals want this type of thing. Now, their hotels have um, have innovated. The Four Seasons Bora Bora has like a month long rate right now. They have like 10 days, 20 days and month long. Silver Sands Grenada in the Caribbean is offering a package where you can actually go and uh, if you stay for a certain amount of time, you get two uh, sessions with their trainer per week. And there's um, snacks laid out during like tea time for like your workday, workday snacks. Um, they've upped the Wi-Fi all over property. They have different areas where people are kind of like co-working together. So the hotels are sort of thinking about that. Another, I had a client who wants to be staying for in Hawaii for an entire month this summer and that hotel actually I actually negotiated rates with them which hardly ever happens so there is some of that happening but the hotels themselves are not purpose built for this so I'll take it one step further than Sun like I've been we road tripped 15 weeks out of this past year and stayed most of them in in hotels as well and like I had to be like hey do y'all have an extra desk in the back that you can bring in because um, we we're both working we're carrying our monitors with us that kind of thing. So hotels just aren't purpose built for that, for work, for eating. You get a little tired eating hotel food every single meal, every single day when you're quarantining. So I think there's an opportunity for a new kind of, um, of, of hospitality to come from this that really services the person who is working remotely. Um, so it's kind of maybe something that's similar to sort of like a co-working, co-living space that has sort of the trappings of luxury and the, on the high end, the, high, the trappings of sort of a resort, but also some of the comforts. And some of that may come from the hotels themselves. Like they may have residences that they turn into something like this, or maybe something totally new. I know there are some folks working on things like that in Costa Rica, for example. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that the complexity of international travel right now is just astounding. It is insane. I don't know how anybody is traveling internationally without like a travel advisor, because even for us, like every day we're checking. So just yesterday, um, the CDC comes out and says that the even American citizens now have to take a COVID test to return to the US. So we're going out to every single person we have traveling in the next three months and being like, okay, the montage in Cabo says they're going to have testing for you on site. So we figured that one out. Now we have to figure out our client going to Morocco, like where are they going to get their tests? That is so complex. And that's why most of the higher end travelers do rely on an advisor, but there's got to be some kind of technology solution for that. So someone who's smart and listening and who wants to come up with something around that could help. And I think the smaller governments also are really struggling with this. So there could be some kind of technology play to help them as well. Whether it's like the intake of COVID forms or um, we have seen some of these uh, apps come out that show that you've been COVID vaccinated. There's going to be all kinds of like technology um, solutions to help um, to help kind of like verify your ability or um, passing restrictions to travel over the next year. Yes, yes. I think COVID testing is a huge part right now for international travelers. And I think a lot of countries, just because it's all different country, different situations, and the solutions to all across the platforms, it's just not uniform. Everybody has different criteria as well. That's why it has been difficult. But like Sarah said, wishfully, we have some solution and technology get involved to solve this problem. And last but not least, Scott, what's your take on this as well? Well, I have a list of things that I predict is definitely going to happen and would be nice to happen. But to echo Sarah's point first, we've seen the, the, the term staycations has really came in this year, but workcations, and I tried to trademark it in Europe, but someone's already done it, but workcations are massively popular because people, they're just going to get away from their two-bed apartment in a city like London. And there's an exodus from the capital of the UK to go and do workations in the country and, you know, places in, in the highlands of Scotland to just disappear. There's no one about, there's no COVID and work. 
So um, workations is going to be a big part of our strategy moving forward this year. So here's some, some tech and customer experience things that I think will 100% come in. Uh, and Sun mentioned it as remote and easier check-ins. Now, the check-in experience, it's not very innovative. It takes time. It's frustrating for me who just wants in and straight out. So it's going to be remote. It's going to be streamlined. You might not have any human contact. It's going to be nice and easy. Voice is going to be a big thing and not just with COVID. This would have happened anyway, but voice activation of all your internet of things, apps, you know, TVs, lights coming on. So voice and the rise of, of Siri and Alexa it was going to be coming into the hospitality industry. And I feel that that will be around touching things things and spreading COVID, we are going to have voice activation and it's already happened but I think this will be mainstream is rather than keys it's all going to be smartphone activated and the last I stayed in a Hilton two days before lockdown and you activated it with your phone and picked your room via so rather than just wondering what your room is you're going to be able to pick your room via a map and so the cool things I think are going to happen so I think those will happen the things that will be coming in is definitely facial recognition in some way, and that would be the personalization when you go in the room. AR and virtual reality. So there's lots of studies, there's lots of reports and hotels trialing that. Location-based services for customer experience and upselling. So there was a, a Hilton hotel doing this, I can't remember where, but if they went to certain parts of the big Hilton hotel, they would get a phone notification on their smartphone to say there's a drink special offer at the bar that you're at. So I think we'll get more sophisticated, at not just having rooms, i.e. the accommodation, but the upselling and the customer service of specific location-based services. And finally, we spoke about the voice activation. Well, there was a hotel in Amsterdam that had a mood pad and you can activate everything from an iPad. So you just speak to it, you touch it, you do the lights, you do the TV, you do the windows, absolutely heating the air con. So I think that's going to be standard within a few years. And very quickly, some non-tech things that I think sustainability is going to be a big part. And Sarah will talk about that. It's going to be a big part of travel from businesses' point of view, but also consumers' choices' point of view. Obviously, higher hygiene standards, we've seen it. Whereas if there was a, a mark on a window or a hair in the sink, you would never get a complaint. But now people are demanding a refund because of the heightened awareness of hygiene because of COVID. So people are getting refunds very easily for a lower cleaning standard. So cleaning standards will be much higher and flexibility as well. People used to book well in advance. They're leaving it to the last minute and booking.com say, you know, last minute bookings are 80 to 90% of their bookings and people want that flexibility. You need to be giving a 100% refund even a few days before because it isn't the guest's fault they can't do it. It's government policy changing at the last minute. So um, there's some predictions that might happen and some things from a tech and customer service viewpoint, I think will happen for sure. Yes, yes, great, uh, great insight, Scott. Yes, uh, from all the panelists mentioned, uh, one thing I think right now in trend is also uh, my take, my thoughts on this is sometimes when you see AR and VR uh, virtual tour, some right now is getting popular. I think one of our new chips companies is doing that, which you can tour this uh, a tour, uh, very famous um, attractions using your phone or your laptop so you can see what's going on over there, which is a new thing coming up. Um, but when it comes to a lot of new technologies like touch, like uh, data collection points, especially in the Europe now with GDPR in place, a lot of the privacy regulations will kick in very soon just regarding the tourist um, uh, technologies coming up. Uh, just one touch point on um, all the contribution from the panelists. Um, great. So this is all very useful. And it leads to my last question for you today is with so many things going on around the world, we never know what's going to happen next. However, what does the future hold for the hospitality and travel industry? Are startups able to um, raise more funding or well, venture capitalists or other investors still look into this space. Um, what's your thought on this? Uh, we start with Sun again. Well, I think um, if you're not um, thinking about that as an investor, 
uh, or or you have a product for the hospitality industry, um, I think it's actually a great time to think about. It. Um, I definitely think you know, there's people who can kind of plan ahead, right? And so what's likely to happen? So I think people will definitely travel again uh, a lot. Uh, vaccines are out. Um, many of my friends are um, in healthcare, the healthcare workers. I have uh, doctors, dentists, optometrists. They've already gotten their first uh, dose of the vaccine. And as you know, uh, it takes two doses about a month apart. But even after a single dose, when I sort of observe my friends, uh, they don't have nearly as much fear as they had in the past. Uh, there's an effectiveness of the first dose that you get. It's not, it's not the full 95% of the 90%, but you know, upon the second dose, it gets to that. But even after the first dose, just the way they, uh, how cautious they are, um, it's uh, totally different. And I think, uh, you know, probably majority of the world have cabin fever. Uh, I think they're dying to get out. Uh, they're just waiting until it's safe. And so I think, you know, so many uh, um, great um, organizations in the medical industry are providing those solutions, vaccines where we can be safe again. So when that happens, oh yeah, I think they'll definitely, um, we'll, we'll see a full flights, uh, we'll see occupied hotels. So you just have to have the right idea. It'll be a little bit different, I think. I think people will even though all vaccinated, they'll travel, but still try to avoid crowds or uh, touch things. And so like voice, as Scott mentioned, will maybe become more important. So I think you just have to have the right idea for the uh, post COVID world. Uh, but I do think they'll travel again. And, but I think people will uh, be smarter about where they go um, and where they stay. And so I think, um, you know, they'll, they'll shop smartly. So the destination that they choose, the hotel that they stay at the destination, they'll be very, uh, I think, more selective, right? Uh, and so um, I think you just have to have the right idea um, and plan for it. Um, and so it doesn't even have to be tech. It could be just services, for example. Uh, tents are opening up for restaurants because, you know, outdoor dining is allowed in many uh, cities where indoor dining isn't. So uh, does the hotel have, let's say, rooftop dining? nice view it's just a service it's not a technology but should should they offer that would i be more likely to stay there probably right i'll, I'll have to eat while i'm there but if they have nice rooftop dining it's outdoors uh open air uh, that's probably gonna uh, have an impact on my decision so uh, whether it's tech or services i think definitely if you kind of plan ahead there's going to be plenty of great ideas uh, and i think definitely people will be traveling uh, very soon Yes, yes. Thank you, Sun. Uh, Sarah, also from your point of view as a travel planner, uh, what's your thought on this? Yeah, I mean, I know I kind of opened my story talking about the industry and how, how dire things were in March and April and May. But, um, but I, I will also just point out that after that, we continually started to add business back and we actually grew slightly 2020 over 2019. Um, so what that says is that although there are uh, basically that people still have traveled during this pandemic they have maybe been tied to domestic and i know scott's a lot harder in the in scotland and in the uk and some other countries but within the us we had a ton of domestic travelers mexico was always open the caribbean is now open um and so we had people traveling maybe there's some sort of sense of like travel shame like people weren't necessarily talking about it as much but people still wanted to get out there. And I agree with you, Sun, that there's like, there's a wall of demand that's coming towards all of us. As soon as people start to feel safe again, we're gonna get just slammed. Um, so we've been sort of preparing for that in the industry on my side. Um, but then you, you also asked about like VCs and startups yeah. and I'm not tr like truly on that side anymore, but I, from what I know from the funds I'm invested in and um, just from talking to a couple of friends who have travel startups, I think what we're seeing actually, at least 
in 2020 was that VCs were putting most of their dry powder into their winners. Um, so reinvesting into their already existing portfolio companies that they're truly excited about rather than picking up new ones. And we've seen that trend from VCs in past cycles as well. And so from what I can tell, it has been harder for newer startups in the travel space to raise money in 2020. But maybe with the vaccine and some of these like initial interesting signals coming out for 2020, later 2021 and 2022, that will change. And I, for anybody who's an aspiring like entrepreneur in this space, just, I mean, you know this, but just keep in mind, Airbnb started in the last recession and, you know, there weren't a lot of people thinking that that was a great idea at the time either. So. Yes. Yes. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. Yes. This will, will be, we have heard from the industry, from the startups in, at NewTrip as well, that most of the uh, venture capital stop uh, investing in new companies, but also, but only invest in uh, the existing portfolios. Um, but gradually, we might, might be able to see the change very soon after the vaccines and uh, the situation got stabilized as well. Um, so Scott, what's your uh, thought on this? Well, we, we started fundraising probably in November, so the, the worst time to do this. And as you might imagine, a lot of our pitches came back with, yes, we like your business, but we, we are not investing in that sector just now, which is understandable why people wouldn't do this. But some of the feedback we've got specifically is that our industry is actually very good for investors because... <laughs> We managed to make profit through every single month in COVID, and that's that's quite nice. That, that's down to my team, so not me. But we managed to make profit every single month and advance the business on. So the feedback we've got from investors that are investing in that our industry is that this has laid businesses bare before. People could do a pitch deck and get through a little bit of due diligence and be get investment. But if you can make profit in this business or, or even survive COVID and come out the end stronger, then that shows that that's a good investment for VCs. So that's the feedback that we've got. And one of our competitors did a raise in the UK of a million, a million dollars and they still didn't make money. They had a million pounds to do things with, and we haven't had any investment that managed to make money. So it highlights the good businesses from the bad, and I think that should be good for investors. Um, the last thing I would say on this is people phone and speak to me and we were in online things like this and say, Scott, tourism's dead, hospitality's dead, it'll never recover. And I suppose my answer to that is, you know, <laughs> Tourism, hospitality, people taking holidays have been there for probably thousands of years, but hundreds of years. We've went through two world wars, which are going to be more devastating than this. And just because we've had a world war, it didn't obliterate tourism and travel. Things had to adapt and it might take a few years to come back. So um, people always say Airbnb, the, the Airbnb thing is a fad, but the industry was there well before Airbnb and it'll be there for hundreds of years after Airbnb disappeared. So uh, the tourism industry is definitely here to stay. There's so many countries and areas of countries that depend on it heavily for their whole economy. So I was over in the Canary Islands uh, a few months ago and in Lanzarote, and they are welcoming me in. They're doing things like giving you, you know, discounted corporation tax to, to set up businesses. They're going to put massive incentives. And I had a call with the, the Scottish government today, actually, um, with our advisor, a business advisor, and there is a massive hotel industry rescue package. So Scotland, where I am, is going to be putting massive resources behind backing hotels and getting the tourism industry back to normal. So some areas aren't tourist areas, but the areas in the countries that are will, will come back as soon as possible and people will want to travel. And some people won't want to get vaccinated to travel. Some people will be scared. The sun said the crowds are going to freak people out for a long time, but Again, I think we'll get back to normal and I think we'll come back stronger. We're going to we're going to appreciate that vacation a lot more than we did prior because we took it for granted. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, yes, all panelists just mentioned one point that I think most entrepreneurs and investors should know is after the pandemic is over, it's going to be a huge demand on traveling. Uh, I don't know about other guys, but at least me and my husband, we are desperate to travel again and then go to different countries and visit families in um, Ireland and also uh, in China as well. So um, 
this is what we are looking for. And then most of venture capitals know that there will be more demand coming in with the travels. Like Scott said, we appreciate the travel, appreciate um, the capabilities to go around and meet families and friends more. Um, Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. So our discussion is coming to the end. I appreciate your time on behalf of our new chip a startup community. Uh, it is a tough time for the industry right now, but we do have a lot of hope coming up. Uh, we all cannot wait to travel again and got together with our loved ones. Um, so until next time, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. See you. Thank you. Thank you very much.